Joining us uh, on this week's tech volatility in the 2024 race for the White House, Joe Lonsdale is here, Palantir co-founder and founding partner, of course, of 8VC and so many other things. Uh, it's nice to see you, Joe. We've, uh, we've had a heck of a week in the markets. I know you play in the private markets, but all of these things are interrelated. And I'm sort of curious just how you think our economy and which way our economy is moving at this point. Well, you know, Andrea, it was fun to see the Palantir earnings right after two days of the markets all falling apart. Kind of saying, by the way, guys, this AI stuff's actually working. We're actually growing really fast. And it felt like it turned things around a little bit. I mean, listen, I think a lot of the volatility this week was tied to things like Japanese banks, which obviously are an important part of the global economy. But, you know, the story here in the U.S. is that our, our companies are working, our innovation economy is growing really quickly. So we may be facing some macro headwinds, uh, but the AI stuff's real. Well, so that was the question. Uh, Palantir has made this work. The question how, is, is that idiosyncratic? which is to say, is there something special going on at Palantir that may not be going on uh, across, across the industry? Or do you think that there actually is more meaningful legs to this? You saw the Goldman Sachs report probably in the past week where they suggested maybe actually that we're not going to get the kind of sort of growth gains uh, out of AI, at least immediately, than some people had anticipated. Yeah, I don't think this is happening immediately. I think if you talk to people like Sam Altman and OpenAI and others, it's like we've, we've in a sense, we've, we've failed so far because it's not impacting the entire economy right away. Now, that said, you know, the services industry in the U.S. is about four and a half trillion in wages. Probably about a third of that can be addressed and be made more productive with AI and higher productivity. So it makes all of us wealthier. We're seeing things like in healthcare billing, logistics billing, the back end, you know, TPA processes and insurance. You're, we're seeing this in private companies get to be a lot more productive. We're tripling, quadrupling the productivity. That's not going to happen where it scales out to the whole economy overnight. But listen, if we're back here and it's 2027, 2028, and we're not seeing that in productivity statistics, I'll be really surprised. What about things like Apple? Uh, you know, we watched uh, Warren Buffett, you know, get out of half of his position effectively in the company. But more importantly, the question becomes, does a company like that uh, have a sort of massive super cycle upgrade this fall, or is that something that you think ends up ultimately getting pushed out farther in terms of something that is truly game changing? You know, there's lots of really cool stuff we could do with consumers and AI. I use I use these little things all the time to ask them questions. It's really helpful to figure out what's going on in the world, to draw pictures with your kids. Uh, does this change Apple's business in the next year? Probably not. Uh, Apple's facing really strong headwinds from a lot of new Chinese competitors. It's not clear to me. The new phones are you know, nearly as good relative to the old phones versus what we saw 10 years ago. So they may, they, they may have a little bit of a tougher time. I want to move towards politics, and, but I want to start with policy first. Curious what your reaction was to the judge's decision against Google this week, uh, effectively calling it a monopoly. You know, I, I, you know I've, I've been on this for a long time with little tech versus big tech, as Mark Andreessen said really well recently. I'm a fighter for little tech. I'm a fighter for the innovation economy. I think a lot of these big tech companies have become not only kind of slow and ideologically corrupted, uh, I think they, they, they're they basically monopolies. I think that's right. And so the question is, you know, what are we going to allow monopolies to do in our society? How much can they abuse their power? If something is affecting hundreds of millions of people, if, it, if tons of these things are tied into it, we probably need some rules around it. I'm not, I'm not against even going so far as to break some of them up. But go ahead. Joe, I saw I saw a poll. I saw a poll yesterday. I think the, the Jews in New York even now are supporting Trump slightly ahead of Harris. And this is amazing how how weak this administration is and foreign policy wise, how much uh, right now they're holding Israel back, knowing they're about to be attacked, not letting them strike the missile sites. Uh, you know, in Silicon Valley right now, listen, like she said, she'd end private health insurance with Bernie Sanders. She's the only other one who raised her hand about ending, you know, putting socialism in there. She said she'd break the filibuster for the Green New Deal. Uh, you know, breaking the filibuster is terrifying. That's how you really... Carp emphasized that retail investors recognized Palantir's potential before many so-called smart money players did. While others were hesitant, retail investors put their money and their reputations on the line for Palantir. They've weathered tough times and emerged stronger. To see a CEO of a $70 billion company with fundamentals as impressive as Palantir's stand up for retail investors is remarkable. Carp sees this as a crucial step in re-establishing Western dominance over its adversaries. He believes it's about more than just politics. It's about restoring a sense of security and confidence in American leadership. For many of us who cherish the values and freedoms of the Western way of life, this message resonates deeply. As someone who appreciates what the West stands for, I want to see it preserved and strengthened. There are certainly those who want to see the system burn down those who thrive on chaos and upheaval. For them, without that, he warns the entire system could collapse like a house of cards. Carp's message might not land. But for anyone who believes in the ideals of democracy and freedom, it's a powerful call to action.
If you're dissatisfied with the current state of affairs, CARP suggests looking elsewhere, perhaps to countries like Iran or China, rather than trying to dismantle the foundations that have brought so many opportunities and advancements. It's a rallying cry to defend what we value and ensure that America remains strong on the global stage. In the past, Palantir struggled to penetrate corporate markets due to internal politics. Companies had invested heavily in existing systems, making them hesitant to adopt new solutions. They feared looking foolish by switching to something that could potentially outperform their expensive, customized tools. However, I predicted that this gatekeeper problem would resolve itself. As a few bold clients took a chance on Palantir and achieved significant success, other businesses would naturally follow suit, leading to an oversubscribed business model. Palantir is currently in a pivotal position. Customers are eager to partner with them, but demand is outpacing supply. The cost of not engaging with Palantir has skyrocketed, making it more worthwhile for companies to overcome any initial hesitation. Peter Thiel anticipated this shift long before others did. In his 2017 book, Zero to One, he outlined a vision for creating a monopoly in an emerging market with a product that few fully understood. At the time, many viewed his ideas as radical, but today they resonate clearly. Alex Karp also reinforces a point I've made recently, large language models LLMs are becoming commoditized. The real value lies not in the LLMs themselves, but in the infrastructure and operating systems that support them. While companies like Midia are thriving in this space, Palantar's moment is still on the horizon. People are starting to recognize Nivea's dominance, but Palantir is poised to take the stage next. Palantir is building a company focused on delivering tailored solutions for clients with the speed and efficiency of an automated off-the-shelf product. Think about that for a second. Alex Karp, the CEO and founder of Palantir Technologies, just left the CNBC panel utterly speechless. He made a bold statement that few would expect from the CEO of a $70 billion company. Karp has serious confidence, and in my videos, I don't keep you hanging, I'm going to share exactly what he said right at the start. The bottom line always comes first analysis can wait. If you've got things to do, I get it. I'm not here to create retention for revenue, it's all about the bottom line. So, let's dive in. First, he claimed that Palantir is set to 10x its current value, predicting it will reach a staggering $700 billion. While many CEOs might dream of such growth, Karp boldly declared it on national TV as if it were just another day at the office. This reflects not only his unwavering confidence, but also the vision he has for the company. Now, let's break down how he delivered this message and explore the other mind-blowing insights he shared during the interview. Second, traditionally, selling software meant creating something that already existed to secure funding, then forcing it onto clients in a cumbersome way. Palantir flips that model completely. They offer a flexible sandbox environment where clients can specify their needs, allowing for truly customized solutions rather than a one-size-fits-all approach. Stock analysis, Palantir, when it comes to your business, its unique challenges and specific needs, we dive deep into understanding them. Our team is made up of the brightest minds and we craft tailored software solutions that are fully automated yet designed just for you. This interview showcases Alex Karp's true character. He's resolute and unyielding, confidently addressing skeptics and pushing back against doubt. He's outspoken, firmly believing in Palantir's potential to achieve remarkable growth, something many in Silicon Valley wouldn't have dared to say a year ago. When I started this investment journey, many pointed to Snowflake, noting Warren Buffett's investment and their impressive client base. They praised Frank Slootman, suggesting Snowflake was the gold standard. But let's take a closer look. While Snowflake generated significant buzz in 2020, it still hasn't turned a profit. In contrast, Palantar has been consistently profitable. Over the past year, Snowflake's EBITDA has decreased by 24%, whereas Palantar's has surged by 500%. While Snowflake's net income dropped by 18%, Palantir's cash position has increased by 1,000%. In short, Palantir stands out as a strong player in the market, demonstrating resilience and growth potential that shouldn't be overlooked. Palantir Overview Palantir has seen a 30% increase over the past year and is currently trading at a significant premium. It's one of the most talked about stocks in the market right now. Is it expensive? Yes, could it drop by 50%? Absolutely. These are all valid concerns reminiscent of the hype cycle we saw we saw with Tesla. That's why dollar cost averaging DCA is so important. By buying shares consistently every couple of weeks, whether the price goes up or down, you can smooth out your investment costs. If the stock drops below a certain threshold, which you can learn to set up in our academy, you can adjust your buying strategy to accumulate shares more rapidly. This approach can lead to substantial gains over time, even if the market seems stagnant. 
Palantir has impressive fundamentals, including a 30% free cash flow margin and a rule of 40 score that's considered exceptional. The company has nearly doubled its workforce in just five years, growing from 2,400 employees in 2019 to almost 4,000 today. Despite concerns about share dilution, Palantir has only diluted its shareholders by about 10% over the last three years. In 2019, the company had $1 billion in cash, now it boasts $4 billion. While it faced losses in previous years, it recently reported a profit of $210 million over the trailing 12 months. In summary, while Palantir carries risk like any hyped stock, its fundamentals and DC strategy could position investors for strong returns in the long run. Business is thriving at Palantir even as prices continue to drop, reminiscent of the trends we saw in 2022. This is the perfect time to dollar cost average, as I've mentioned before. The company's free cash flow has skyrocketed from $46 million in 2019 to an impressive $550 million today. Revenue has also seen remarkable growth. Jumping from $1.1 billion in 2020 to $2.5 billion, now a 2.5x increase in just four years. Palantir has spent the last few years eliminating fears and doubts while smart money shorted the stock, labeling it a bad investment. However, retail investors recognized the company's potential and seized the opportunity without the typical premiums. Those who bought shares at $7, $8, $9, $10, $12, $15, $15 and even $20 have seen significant returns. In fact, the stock is up 123% over the past six months and 41% in recent weeks. Clearly, it's not just a $5 stock after all. Palantir recently faced a common question from the audience, what do you actually do? This question often comes from those unfamiliar with the tech landscape, especially in the media. Alex responded succinctly, saying, we help companies understand their business better than ever before. The idea is that with Palantir's solutions, businesses can become their own disruptors, staying ahead of emerging competitors instead of getting sidelined. Palantir's software empowers companies to innovate continuously, ensuring they don't fall behind in their industries over the next 10, 15, or even 20 years. This approach isn't just a slick sales pitch. It's reflected in the fact that many clients are willing to invest millions annually in their services. In the past, Palantir struggled to penetrate corporate markets due to internal politics. Companies had invested heavily in existing systems, making them hesitant to adopt new solutions. They feared looking foolish by switching to something that could potentially outperform their expensive, customized tools. However, I predicted that this gatekeeper problem would resolve itself. As a few bold clients took a chance on Palantir and achieved significant success, other businesses would naturally follow suit, leading to an oversubscribed business model. Alantar is currently in a pivotal position. Customers are eager to partner with them, but demand is outpacing supply. The cost of not engaging with Palantir has skyrocketed, making it more worthwhile for companies to overcome any initial hesitation. Peter Thiel anticipated this shift long before others did. In his 2017 book, Zero to One, he outlined a vision for creating a monopoly in an emerging market with a product that few fully understood. At the time, many viewed his ideas as radical, but today they resonate clearly. Alex Karp also reinforces a point I've made recently, large language models LLMs are becoming commoditized. The real value lies not in the LLMs themselves, but in the infrastructure and operating systems that support them. While companies like NVIDIA are thriving in this space, Palantir's moment is still on the horizon. People are starting to recognize NVIDIA's dominance, but Palantir is poised to take the stage next. This stock is Palantir, sitting at the bottom of a mountain on a beautiful day, unaware of the avalanche approaching. When that moment hits, Palantir will have its NVIDIA moment. I've been saying this for four years and while some called me crazy, the narrative is shifting now. Palantir is building a company focused on delivering tailored solutions for clients.